This is a, a fundraiser for Festival of Words next month. It, and Festival of Words is a literary organization that brings reading classes and other events to the population with less or little opportunity. Yes. Pardon? Is, is that better? All right. So I'd like to thank the sponsors and our performers that are here that are be reading their original works tonight, our volunteers, and you, the audience, and of course, Omni Center for hosting us. So let's give them a, a hand. <clears throat> There's also a table out front with merchandise, and your donations are also accepted. Uh, we have various participants tonight, and our timer down here is Justin, so he'll be giving you the signals. Two minutes and one minute and stop. Our first presenter tonight is Ed Gauthier. Let's welcome him. Uh, I've, Ed and I were just discussing, uh, we've been friends for about 40 years. Um, he actually, he and his wife actually were at my wedding and I was at he and Anna's wedding. And I was also uh, a midwife attending his first, his first child. So we have a lot of connections and he, y'all told me to get closer. He's an awesome writer. He's been writing since third grade. He's published poetry, short stories, essays, and his first novel in, entitled Director Guy, which is available on Amazon.com. So without further ado, let's welcome Ed. Go Che. Thank you. Um, the short biography is that I write because of my evil wife. Uh, because if I didn't write, she would tape the hammer to my hand and I'd have to keep it there until I finished the front porch. <laughs> so I'd rather be writing. This is called Dream Wheel. Uh, when I first wrote it in 2014, it was a triptych, three parts. And uh, when I sent it out to be published, I was shocked it's published in three days and so I brought it back out dream wheel soldier I awoke sat up and realized that the circular platform I was on was floating high above the mountains under a high cloud I had no idea how I got there and I don't know how it just hovered there like that two others were already there Utina and Paul they immediately wanted to know my story, especially what I'd been dreaming. I told them that I had been in my jail cell, alone, sleeping, and my, my dreams were the nightmares I always had of combat. My outpost had been overrun by Afghan rebels. After more than 12 hours of constant fighting, lots of it hand-to-hand, -hand, bodies everywhere, I was lightly wounded, I thought. My nightmares got so bad that I later tried to kill people on the streets of San Diego. SWAT team stopped me with a tranquilizer dart. I was jailed and went to sleep on the sail buck. It's never ending combat once I fall asleep, I explained to them. Suddenly, I heard the whistling incoming of a martyr round. I dragged Utina and Paul into the recessed center of the big wheel we were on and told them to get down. Bullets were flying. There was smoke and men running, firing weapons. I was sweating and began screaming. I didn't even have a gun. But Otina wrapped her arms around me and said, I'm here with you, into my ear. Immediately, the bullets stopped, the smoke cleared, and all the fighters were gone. The mountains and clouds were back. All was quiet. They explained that our dreams controlled the wheel we were on. These two had just experienced my combat nightmare. We rested a moment. Then I saw that Paul wore a long desert robe from a distant tribe different from those of Afghanistan. Paul, 
Paul told us he had been traveling to Damascus by horse with warrants to arrest the followers of the way. They were to be taken back to Jerusalem to be tried for blasphemy. Just outside of Damascus, a great light came into the sky, unhorsing him. It was lightning. When he spoke these words, the wheel abruptly shifted under us, and light blazed in from every direction. We protected our eyes. I couldn't look up, but I saw Paul reach up with his hands and speak to someone in the air. He begged not to be killed. He grabbed his head and shouted that he had not realized. Begging for mercy for himself and the others traveling with him, he knelt and prayed and then prostrated himself, saying he would serve forever. He repeated the name Ananias of Damascus, who would baptize him. Slowly the light dissipated. Utina and I crawled to him and asked if he was all right. He rose to his knees, shaking, his pupils unfocused. He could not fix his gaze on anything. We helped him lean back against the sloped wall of the recess center. Paul said the light spoke to him and changed him from Saul, his old self, to Paul, the Paul we knew. His vision returned after a while. Utina asked if he often dreamed of the light. He said he dreamt of nothing else. His dreams always made him relive the great change again and again. <coughs> Utina. Utina calls this platform the dream wheel. She's been here the longest. Some guy named Dogen and a woman named Clara were here before her. They told her of people before them and some of the dreams they'd witnessed. <coughs> the wheel's power manifesting itself. Utina tried getting off. She jumped over the edge, but the thing has gravity. She even crawled around to the underside. <coughs> but, she, but you just hang there upside down. She's seen 127 dream sequences. Yeah, she's counting. Many have seen her dream. I asked her what her dream was. Without warning, a large man grabbed me from behind and threw me onto the surface of the wheel. Just as I turned over, he was on me, trying to tear off my shirt and my pants. I heard the others scream. I slugged the guy and knocked him off me, rolled away. I jumped up and caught him with a fast roundhouse kick, sending him sprawling. He sat up, but a kick to the temple put him out. The guy on Paul looked like a twin. A rabbit punch to the back of his head sent him down out cold. Paul grabbed the one on, on Utina, wrestled him off. I kicked him in the kidney and the head, and he went down. And at that moment, the three of them disappeared. They were all identical. We held Utina, told her <coughs> they were gone. She trembled uncontrollably. Paul rubbed, his her, rubbed her hand. Who were they, I asked. She said they were her father's favorite brother who had molested her since she was 16, that the dream multiplies him to three. I asked if she'd told her father. She huffed at me and said her father would kill her if she said such a thing. I knelt next, next to Atina, staring in her dark eyes. This woman had kept me from going crazy, telling me truths about the platform we were on, warning me. I reached into a side pocket and drew out a very large switchblade knife, held it in front of her, pressed the button on the side. The double-edged blade snapped out and locked in place. Utina's eyes studied the knife. I rolled it over and over my palm, then unlocked the blade and closed it. Again, I pushed the button and the blade flashed out. Once more, I unlocked the blade and closed it. I could tell she had memorized the simple operation of the weapon. <coughs> your uncle will come up close to you, embracing you. When he does, you bring the knife up behind him, push the button to open the blade, and stab deep into the kidney. Once in deep, twist hard. Either kill him or use this knife to escape and never return. With these words, Utina froze and her big eyes grew even larger. I slipped the knife under her hand. I could see her mind working on it. It happened so quickly that I reached out to touch her shoulder. 
but too late. She was gone. Both Paul and I recoiled, stood, and looked around. Utina was not there. I heard Paul call out behind me. A girl, maybe 13 years old, was sleeping in the recessed center section. She opened her eyes and looked at Paul and I. She got up and slowly approached me. Her dress was animal leather with ornate beadwork and frill frills dangling from him, sleeves and bodice. She wore leather moccasins and her hair, blonde, parted in the middle, split into braids that reached mid-back. Tosee, she said, and then added, what is this place? Some call it the dream wheel. I'll try to explain. How are we doing? One minute? All right. This is a, a poem called Acuity. Um, I'm sorry, called Actuality. It's not too long. Existence congeals stardust and dark matter, causation coiling itself with a twirl. Sensations detect there is something that joins us to valleys, mountains, and the ocean's wide world. Lie down in dark canyon and race past the planets. Hear the breath breathing, and lo, you are there. Watch the mind thinking, snatching at concepts like an aggressive dog's jaw just floating in air. And the hooves of the buffalo pound into earthquakes, and the whistles of whales cry up through the frog. Listen to the distant horizon of drum beats as civilization jumps up and writes down how to crawl. The mind builds the world, every sand grain to stone, and the world quickly ruins it back to the sea. Though we give our outpouring and harvest back what we may, in our place, in our time, there is nothing to be. Thank you. Thank you, Ed, for that. <laughs> oh, you got your, give it up for Ed again, one more time. Thank you so much. I just want to remind everybody to uh, silence your cell phones. I know sometimes uh, we forget, and I think I even forgot. <laughs> so we have next up, we have Teresa, Teresa Roloff, born in Miami, Florida. College she found relocated to the state of Texas. Writing has been an outlet for expression early on with anonymous submissions to literary collections and newspaper edit letters to the editor. Let's give it up for Teresa. Before I came here, uh, I was going to bring a lady who uh, is disabled, and she stands, spends most of her time in her home. And I knew she was a poet, and she gave me her book and asked me to read this poem. Uh, she has a pen name. It's uh, Tiff John, and her little book is The Broken Poet. And she has this poem called Mirror. I am as though to be on the wrong side of the mirror. I have taken a good look at myself and I do not like what I saw. I truly mean to do better, but I am so crushed that I am now on the other side of the mirror, trying hard to be loved and understood and for others to look on the other side. Think the other way, see and hear me, but I am shut out on both sides now. Just look inside and find me. Okay, this poem, I'm just going to call it my dad, and it's more or less just a remembrance of things with him. Uh, by the time it was February, my dad was dead. He actually died in January, but I found out two days later. His wife called. She said it was bad news. She wasn't kidding. My dad was 85. He'd moved to Mexico years before. By the time he was 80, he had a slew of friends there. Others like him who had whatever it took to leave America behind and loved the risk and adventure and disdain for what most people here hold dear. 
My dad was a wild man of sorts. I would hear occasional stories from unexpected sources, like once a classmate younger than me said my dad was cute. That was weird. <laughs> when my dad turned 80, arrangements were made to fly me to a surprise party five years before. After over 50 years of not seeing him, he stopped in Louisiana on his way to Mexico. He and his wife had braved a storm after years of sailing six months out of every year, going from place to place, island to island, with floating neighborhoods of sorts. That wicked storm broke their mast and their rudder. They were probably lucky to survive. It was enough to send them packing to Mexico without a boat. They had already found a place there to call home once they finished the walls, added windows and doors, and of course a lampa on top, on top of three stories. As far as I know, my dad did it all himself. He was resourceful, always. That party was fun. We stayed at the house. There were neighbors close by with chickens and street dogs. There was a library painted bright blue like the night sky with stars and turquoise. It was next to the house, but I never saw much in the way of books there. But our time there was good, and we had fun. The last time I saw him was the Christmas before last. He was in great health, but he had his arm in a sling, an old injury from his first Christmas in Mexico. A dog had lunged at his new pup, and the pup tripped him and hurt that same arm that had been broken years before. My dad was walking his dog in January when a vehicle of some kind hit him. I didn't ask many questions, but I was told that he was life flighted to Houston. He said he wanted to go home, his wife told me. She said he was delirious. I know he didn't mean any home up in the sky. My dad wanted to go back to Mexico, but he didn't. The vehicle, probably a motor scooter of some kind with some poor guy driving, struck my dad and he probably hit his head in the fall because he died from a bleeding brain, bleeding red blood in his head. His love for Mexico, the island where he lived. They shot 21 shots in the air to thank him for his service to his country. My dad's best years were in Mexico, but his ashes will stay here. Okay, this one's called El Dueño's Wisdom. El Dueño's a boss. He had purchased a new door, un puerto nuevo, one with a wide window that opened his, con un ventana grande donde puede to view across the expanse, a flat, empty lot, ver la tierra sin arboles. But that lot was empty, and empty as it was, gave him a sense of power, like a king, Echa sentía como un rey. He could look out over the expanse and it made him proud. So much so that el dueño bemoaned. Dueño estuvo triste. The news that some foreigner had paid a price that he could have paid too if he ever thought someone would claim that land. Por una extraña compró la tierra que el tierra. For their own to build a house that would conquer and fall for one and all and take the expanse away from him. He watched them putting the blocks and the bricks and the wood and the walls, and there went the expanse. El observa la edificio de la casa. La vista a cambio, pero la casa está bien. But it's a good house. It's a nice house, he said, el dice. I went inside and I saw it's nice. Yo entre la casa está bien. The woman living in the house planted many trees. La mujer la extraña. The trees grew, the flowers grew, the grass grew. Ella le gusta las plantas, arboles y flores. Free as the wind, the bugs and the birds gathered. Y los pájaros y el insectos todos. And el dueño watched and he did not like this. Todos están viviendo afuera de la casa. But this was her house and he was not king. El dueño no le gusta. Change your ways, cut your trees, do like I do, said el dueño. Necesita cambio, el dice. The woman listened when she thought, no, I love my house. Pero ella dice, no, esa casa es mía. I love my trees and the birds and the animals. Love them too. Me gusta mucho los árboles y flores y los pájaros y todo. Yo no voy a cambiar nada. I will not cut them down for this man who thinks he's king. The woman stayed and the man learned that he was not king. 
el dueño salió, él no es rey. He did not like that, but he moved away. He tore apart families and made many people wonder about what was his problem. But the woman was strong and she cared about the land as much, if not more, than anyone. And the trees and the flowers still grow. Okay, this may be a little rough for some of you. This is called pro -life, the pro-life sentence. Order in the court, order in the court. I sentence you to a life of heartache and pain, to bear the brunt though you are not to blame, to saddle your family with the faith that you must bear because you were born in a place they don't, where they don't care, where you must be chained to the seed of filth who beat you and raped you and filled you with guilt for no one believes, even though you're a tween, that you truly were walking away from the scene where a man you don't know, three times your age, took your virginity, took it in rage, left you to bear the whispers and wails of a ruthless, uncaring, and ugly man's world. No matter what, no matter if he was father or brother or cousin or uncle or why even bother? Can you tell your mother if that is the case? Who can you tell? You bear the disgrace. Run away, baby. That's not, that's on, your only chance. And maybe the noose, or, or maybe the lance. Thank you to Georgia and the wise men in charge. They have no idea. They think they discharge the rules oh so carefully pinned in their sage wisdom as they strangle the life from your page. Wicked Witch Ivy and John Bell's sentence assigned you a value that's less than a pittance. And God looks down and sees how you cry for the merciful sentence that allows you to die. OK, let's lighten it up a bit. Scott's Limerick, Scott's a city. I live in the city of Scott. It's named for a railroad. It's hot shot. He's cl his claim to fame is the town took his name, but no one's sure if he's, it's not. Some say that Scotty's his name. Some say he's of Scottish domain. Others think he might be of a family Scott tree, and others wonder if he's even the same. But Scott folks know one thing's for sure, that the roots with the railroad endure. Someday I see Warren Buffett may be the focus of our Mardi Gras lore. Imagine the man at the lead condemns all manners of greed and throws to the crowd with a smile wide and proud a greenback with every bead. So come on by and visit my home. We don't have a lake or a dome, but we're conveniently near to all who hold dear. When you show up, you won't feel alone. Okay, this is kind of weird. This is called Then Yet Four Dreams. Four and trying to make sense of it all. One, a black limousine made its way slowly, slowly between rows and rows of workers. You'll have to wait till next year. Let's give it up for Teresa. We loved your stories and your poem. Our next presenter is Abushab Gadir. He's a professor at Tulane University, a poet, and contributes regularly to the New Arab, a London-based newspaper. Bushab. And we've only been friends about four weeks, but he's, he's wonderful. Hello. I will be reading in Arabic. And uh, my colleague Pig will be reading the translation in English. The translation is made by my colleague Ghada Murad. She's a renowned translator and a professor in California, Erivan. Oh, yeah, thank you. Al Gariba. Qalat Shirin in a saifa ajmala ma'a farashatin mu'allakatin ala idan in tawilatin. وتقصد زهرة الأوركيد رقصت أحبت صافرت قرأت استمتعت بالموسيقى 
وتذكرت الغريبة ذات الشعر الطويل الأسود والعينين العسليتين بشرة وجهها كالتي يحملها القادمون من الحرب وجهها كتلك الوجوه الخفيضة التي ألفت الخسارات والهزائم وعاشت فيهما لم تسكن غير السماء التي أسقطتها عليلة ضعيفة لم تسبح في بحر ولا رأت بجعا في بحيرات لم تشرب قهوة الصباح في مقهى لم تتنزه في حديقة لم تكتب رسائل حب ولم تتلقاها لا تتكلم كثيرا تتكلم بالمسموح به تتكلم قليلا لا تتكلم أصلا نسيت أن لها وجها فغطته Shireen said, the summer is more beautiful with butterflies hanging on long sticks. She meant orchid flowers. She danced, loved, traveled, read, and enjoyed music, reminisced the stranger with the long black hair and honey-colored eyes. Her face is like the one worn by those coming from war. Her face is like those low faces that are used to, that are used to losses and defeats and inhabit them. She dwelled in the sky that made her sick and weak. She has not swum in the sea, nor has she seen swan in the lakes. She has not had morning coffee in a cafe. She has not strolled in a park. She has not written love letters, nor has she received any. She does not talk much. She speaks only what's allowable to her. She speaks a little. She does not speak in the first place. She forgot that she had a face, so she covers it. ينفتح منبع الحب تخرج سوسنة فينغلق ينفتح مرة ثانية تطل نرجسة فينغلق ينفتح مرة أخرى فتطل ندبة علقت الأم تمائم على عنقها وحين شدت بشدع الشجرة لم يخرج المسيح خرجت أربع نساء أربع بنات سقطن كالبلح في الصحراء كانت تقول لي دائما إنها ستستفيق غدا أجمل من الصباح إنها أمي تشبه كل شيء إلا وجه امرأة سعيدة كم تمنيت لو رأيتها صغيرة حافية القدمين تطارد فراشات الربيع أحيانا على غير عادتها تفتح شباك النافذة المطل على ساحة يلعب فيها الأطفال وهي تعرف أن العصافير كعادتها لن تعود. The love source opens and a lily comes out, so it gets shut. It opens again, a lily comes out, so it gets shut. It opens once again, and a scar emerges from it. The mother hung, an amu hung amulets around her neck, and when she pulled the tree trunk, the Messiah did not come out. Four girls came out. They dropped like dates in the desert. She would always tell me she will wake up tomorrow more beautiful than the morning. She is my mother. She resembles everything but the face of a happy woman. How I wished I saw her, a little child, chasing barefoot spring butterflies. Sometimes, on occasion, she would open the window, overlooking the courtyard where children play, although she knew that birds, as usual, would not come. هل هناك وجوه للمنتصرين وأخرى للمهزومين في السجون والمنافي كان وجه أمي كل تلك الوجوه ما عاد المنتصرة منها وجه ضليل وجه معتم 
مفترق العمى والتيه وجه طالع من الغيب كاليمام البري وكلما اقتربت منها كان الظل يزحف إليها لم تكن أنت كانت وجها للغياب Are there faces for the victors and others for the defeated in prisons and exile? My mother's face was all of these faces except the vict victorious ones. An opaque face, a dark face, the intersection of blindness and delusion, a face emerging from the unseen like a turtle dove. Whenever I approach it, the shadow would crawl towards it. She was not female, she was the face of the absent. Thank you. Yes, give it up for Bashab. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Peg, for helping out. That was great. Um, next up, we have Jessica Goff. She has a background in journalism, humorism, neuroticism, and <laughs> being neurotic, <laughs> and is an overall cat person. Let's give it up for Jessica. <laughs> because it makes me feel like Springsteen or something, like an acoustic thing. Uh, my, my, uh, my content does not match any of what happened tonight because none of it is serious. So guys, bear with me and please laugh along or laugh at because whew, this is a heavy, heavy night. Can you, can you hear me? This, this goes out to little Stevie. Anybody, can you hear that? All right, my best streaming partner. Um, all right, a little, is this better? I'm, I'm totally that person now to do that. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. okay, all right, okay. Um, yeah, uh, for those who don't know me, I know I look like a human canary, and uh, thanks for, for having me. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to say that uh, journalists and reporters and those who work in the daily grind have a knack for look, pointing out the absurd. Uh, we, humor is not lost upon us. It's an odd mixture of skepticism and acceptance that anything is possible, and yes, that X, Y, Z did happen, and yes, of course, it probably happened in Florida. That's <laughs> I'm a native daughter, so I can say that. But if you're lucky enough, you can maneuver your way through this industry with a strand of empathy, all while understanding the cruel reality that we are all leaving this world in hopefully natural, but possibly unnatural ways. If you go out on the ladder, one of us will write about it. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm not trailing off. I'm not here to talk about eminent death. I'm actually here to talk about wind socks. Yes, uh, it, yes, that, that is actually what I'm here to talk about. Those whimsical flapping, flapping garden kitsch adorned with leprechauns, parrots, dolphins, scarecrows, seashells, spooky ghosts, and sports teams. I've given them to friends, family, without questioning whether they actually wanted the colorful strands of wet canvas flapping on their awnings and front porches. My long-standing and obviously menial obsession is because the windsock, windsock has been my battle flag for several years. A symbol of victory against one single malefactor. His name was Terry, he is seven years old. <laughs> At the time, I was working at a as a reporter for a local paper in New Iberia. It was a low-paying job, therefore, offered low, affordable options for housing. The duplex I lived in, uh, shared flooring, which made evictions in the neighboring hovel uncomfortably audible. Terry and his father lived in a separate house next door. I introduced myself the week before I moved in, which is not something Floridians do. We are not friendly people. <laughs> Most of the people who moved into my hometown came from elsewhere, and they were here to do two things, retire and die. <laughs> but I did my neighborly duty and offered a friendly wave and hello to Terry's father, Big Terry, as he sat under the carport in the evenings seven days a week. The bird feeder was the first to go. That was my conquered hymn. That was my first shot heard around the world. War had been waged, yet I had not realized it. The battered wooden feeder had have returned to my door with, with little Terry's father. It had been found under the boy's bed. No harm, no foul, no foul I thought. He's just a kid. It wasn't until I peeled off a sticker from a lawnmower label from the hood of my car a morning later, I realized there was an unwarranted aggression from the boy next door. 
My God, I'm dealing with an outlaw, I thought to myself as I finished, as I fished out a half-melted pink plastic hubba bubba tape dispenser from my dryer in the carport. The war waged on for months. Flower pots disappeared, obscure action figures were subtly placed outside doorways and on windowsills, almost as a not so subtle message that the boy had been there. These were like missile strikes far away but close enough to prove a point. Shortly after Christmas in 2012, I offered a diplomatic appeasement to the boy through a children's art kit. I walked it over and handed it, uh, handed it to Big Terry with my three and a half foot nemesis behind him. I thought Terry might enjoy the watercolors, I told the father, because young Hitler was an artist too, I've said as I muttered back. But little Terry was not satisfied and the war waged on. I returned home one night to find my bed of pansies destroyed. It was February 14th, Valentine's Day, when people get flowers, but in my case, have them yanked from their tender roots. My father suggested installing security cameras, but I didn't want to introduce new technology during wartime. I was obsessed, but reasoning with the boy's father became no use, for the man carried critical thought of an oyster. Big Terry often meandered over to chat with me outside. His topics of conversation were occasionally peppered with racial slurs. But like the old saying goes, you can't teach an oyster any tricks. <laughs> Saturday nights in the house of Terry were for the, boys, for the boys drinking beer. At the golden hour every evening, Terry's friends would come sailing in on bicycles with, bi uh, with plastic bags carrying six packs dangling from the handlebars. It was assumed that most of these men had their license revoked. It, it's just a guess. Ah. <laughs> on into the night, you could hear clanking of glass bottles hurled into garbage bins over blurring rock, which Terry said was mostly heavy metal. In actuality, it was 38 Special, Ario Speedwagon, and occasional tunes by Creed. I thought about little, little Terry on those Saturday nights. I wondered if those could, be, those could have been the time for, for a peace agreement, or maybe he was just plotting his next move. It took day, two days for the full destruction of the Christmas decorations. This 48-hour blitz included tearing down garland, big red Dollar Tree bows, and shattering my ornaments. What wasn't destroyed was clearly dragged away. Christmas morning brought the boys' most diabolical move. At 7 a.m., Big Terry delivered some Yuletide cheer to the neighborhood by revving up the lawnmower. It seemed like a good enough morning as any. With a cup of coffee in my hand, I sat down to respond to holiday texts from out-of-state family when something out of the living room caught my eye. Twisting from the ironing, uh, iron shepherd's hook, once held the bird feeder, was a glow-in-the-dark plastic skeleton that had disappeared this previous fall. This was no child. This was a pirate. This was a pint-sized Jesse James that had no desire for peace. In the days leading up to the final straw, I watched him obsessively. I paced from window to window in my rental dwelling, watching him from, uh, walking from the sidewalk, staring at the house. He was constantly casing it, plotting his next attack, occasionally eating an, uh, an acorn from the sidewalk. And I had turned into a ghoul. With a heaving running start, he bent a flagpole from the car my card port where the flag of the Conch Republic, Republic waved. If you don't know, that is Key West's uh, attempt to secede in 1982 from the United States. It was a cheeky move. Uh, he had no desire for the flag, he just wanted the pole. The kid was a mastermind, a skillful tormentor. He, actually be he be eventually became bolder and less creative with his aggression, tearing into the porch screen and plucking potted, uh, potted plants one by one as if he was a crazed house fox, hen house fox. The boy was clearly drunk with power. I had almost given up on bringing any cheer to this dowdy exterior's house. I'd raise a white flag, but as I told you, what happened to the flagpole? <laughs> Across the country, post-holiday winter brings retail wave of brassy spring outdoor kitsch that tells us to go outside and stick this thing made from China in your yard. And by God, we'd do it. On a gray February Thursday, I climbed to the top of the roof and hung a cheap pastel windstock, windsock, probably from Dollar Tree, to the corner of my house. It was the corner with the most windows, and I sat there and waited. I know we call the state the outdoorsman's paradise, but you know what's more fun than fishing? Baiting a child. <laughs> it only took two hours for the boy to spot the new object of desire. There's little doubt in my mind he could hear the maniacal laughter coming from the thin walls of the house as he made his third attempt to leap 
for the spinning, twirling tentacles of cheap fabric as it danced out of his reach. I had won. Journalists have a knack for pointing out the absurd, especially when we find it in ourselves. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. That was very entertaining. We enjoyed it so much. About the little terror in New Iberia. <laughs> Our next presenter tonight is Jeannie Dolphin Douglas. She grew up in Opelousas and attended Dillard University. She worked for years in accounting, but has always had a love for art. She is the mother of two very talented children, Gabrielle and Hosea. She currently resides in Broussard and is sharing her works for the first time. Please welcome Jeannie. Hi. I'm dedicating my poems this evening to uh, mental health awareness. Um, you hear a lot in the media about the mentally ill being violent, dangerous, or homicidal. But there's so much more to mental illness. It doesn't manifest that way in everyone. It manifests in a different way in each person. And so my poems are about mental illness from my perspective. OK, this first poem is called Control Bench. I admit it. I admit it. You control me. You got me under your wicked spell. You bitch. Why me? Why must you have me? I used to be great, you know, really wonderful. I loved life, held it in my arms, embraced it and tasted it, sang it, smelled it, caressed and loved it. I wanted more, 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 and still more. I wasn't perfect. Didn't always do it right. At times did it so very painfully wrong. I'd even put it on hold sometimes, stash it away for later perusal and handling, for inspection and disposition at my leisure. But I was forever cur curious and gutsy too, enthusiastic about tasting, feeling, and living life. Then you came along. I think you were always there, really waiting and watching, watching my energy, hiding inside my enthusiasm until you couldn't take it anymore. Did you get jealous? Was I having too much fun? Did I live too much or too well? Or was my tenacity more than you could abide? You know me, I'd fall off the horse and get right back on. I'd fall off and ever return for more. Can I share a little secret with you? It wasn't always fun, but it was vital and enlightening, stimulating, challenging. It was a life worth living. It was a life that belonged to me. Now, I don't know what this crap is. You control me, pull my strings. You manipulate my very essence, filling me up with pain, pain and fear. You give me so much gut-rotting gut emptiness. This can't be what you want, not really. You must be unsatisfied, bored at least. I was once a vital life. Now I'm just an existing, breathing carcass full of reflections only, full of nothing worth having. Oh sure, you allow me brief opportunities to glimpse the life that was once mine. The aroma's there. And I can almost taste it, but I don't. I can't. You greedily snatch all morsels away before they even touch my lips. You don't have to be such a greedy bitch. Better still, you don't have to be here at all. In case you haven't noticed, it's kind of crowded with both of us inside. What is, in actuality, my life? I've become an empty, lonely, fearful, grieving carcass, and you, you're just a greedy, no good, valueless, and unwanted control bitch. It's crowded here with nothing worth having. I simply can't fathom what you're getting out of this undesired relationship. 
As a carcass, I give nothing of value. And you, bitch, you neither give nor get anything of interest or import. One of us has got to go. This life's not big enough for both of us. Okay, this next poem is called Close Companions. Self-doubt and despair are my close companions, yet wanted and cared for they're not, certainly, though days and weeks go by without contact, ever ready they are to be in my life as only forever friends can be. Sometimes I think our bond is blessedly broken, but this is only a dream yet to be. Their devotion is impressive in its oppression. Yet of their care, I wish to be free. I must be free. Their attention I can do without. I dearly need new friends. Their pain in the butt, if you really want to know. It's time this collaboration ends. Out, damn spot, I've heard it said. Oh, if only it was so easy. But the battle is on. I intend to win this game. All you have to do is watch me. <clears throat> okay, this next piece is called Creep, Creep, Creep. <laughs> creep, creep, creep. In the quiet of the night comes the creep, creep, creep of all the desolation these walls contain. Angst, discontent, knife-twisting agony, then tears that won't flow and screams that can't be heard. All in the quiet of the night comes the creep, creep, creep. Sanity consumed in a blazing greed of despair. Creep, creep, creep. I get sucked into the cesspool while bloody fingertips cling to all else, refusing to let go of light or hope or ambition. Night after quiet night comes the creep, creep, creep casting mojos on me in exultant, silent glee. Creep, 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 creep. Okay, this one is called Waters. I dipped my toe in and the water feels fine, so fine. I know these waters, I knew this place long ago, and I long to stay here now. I want to jump in and feel its wonderful caress, let it soothe me and ease my mind. But I'm a trespasser here. These waters aren't mine, so I can't stay, not today. Yet I hear these waters calling my name, gurgling gently and clearly saying the water feels fine, so fine. So I wade along the edge of this body, feeling the waters lap at my feet, hearing the waves whispering to me, saying, jump in, jump in. These waters are lonesome too. Okay, and this last one, is called, I want it back. I want it back, I want my life back. I was once vivacious, curious, quirky, mischievous. I was self-possessed and confident. My personality was infectious. My walk was bouncy, and I loved the life I found myself in. I had dreams and goals, I was happy. Then another it came along and stopped me cold gradually at first, then in a gigantic rush, my life was gone, just like that. And I want it back. No growing old gracefully, no realization of dreams, no resting on my laurels. My life just vanished. Looking in the mirror, I think I catch a glimpse of it, but it's just a phantom wish. I want my life back, and it's gone. I want it back, but I will never, ever, 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 ever get it back. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Give it up for Jeannie again. That was, her poems are for a really good cause, so thank you. Thank you very much. Our next uh, wordsmith is Patrice Melnick, and uh, she has put in so much work into getting all this done over the years. It's amazing. So I just want to give it up for her right now, just for all the work that she does. Really, Patrice, you deserve this. She lives in Great Coteau. She serves on the Festival of Words board. She was named one of the Louisianians of 2019 by Louisiana Life magazine. Sometimes she makes inappropriate remarks. Uh, she would like to travel to Morocco. So let's give it up, Patrice. All right, hi everyone. Um, this poem is called, They Say. I just wanna live long enough to vote that son of a bitch out of office. She's back from the edge of labored breathing, unproductive coughs, and morphine on the hospice bed in the living room facing the sunlit window. The nurses withdraw from predictions as she sits up to demand scrambled eggs and banana chocolate sonic shakes. They say she's rallying, the brief bright spot just before the light fades. Come Sunday, they say, she'll glide from the peak into the Lavender Valley. Monday, they say, is a full moon when many sleepers sink down. Instead, she walks to the bathroom, trailed by green plastic oxygen lines. Tuesday, she washes her own hair, stays awake for CNN 11th hour, raging against images of a Trump rally. At least until next fall, she says, between bites. The nurse checks her pulse, says, when she goes, she will go her way. This one's still a little rough, but I'm gonna read it anyway. It's called The Holy Land. I was trying to figure out what to write about, sitting in the dark, empty meeting chambers at work, coworkers passing through. One man slows to chat, tells me he's, he's taking vacation next week. I ask if he's traveling, and he says, no, just staying home. And I say he should travel to get away from the generic civil service enclave. He pauses, says he wants to ask me a question, but doesn't want to offend me. I say, you won't offend me, though I wonder uh, what he will ask, and if he will, in fact, offend me. His voice goes soft. Are you Jewish, he asks. <laughs> yes, I am, I say. I knew it, he says. Watch, he says he was watching me at one of the meetings, trying to decipher my sloping hieroglyphic visage. I asked if he knew any other Jewish people, and he said no. Whoa, I am a terrible representative with my vagabond habits floating from concert to concert, never a synagogue visit unless my parents press me. No Jewish sisterhood membership, no Hebrew prayer rises from lined lips. Still, he seems too excited that he's met a real Jew and, ask, <laughs> and asks if I'm from Jerusalem. <laughs> no, from Dallas. I watch his gaze fall. My family comes from Eastern Europe, I say, but no look of understanding registers on his face. I vaguely mention Poland, Romania, grandparents immigrating between World War I and II. I do not mention that I have been to Jerusalem because then I would have to admit I was an immature 20-something at the time. I failed to drink in the history and spirituality of the Holy Land. I just floated around in a dead sea and ate falafel sandwiches in a parked car under a bridge. 
I explore, explored mazes of bickering market stalls, contemplating Middle Eastern anxiety, trying to understand why similar people struggle and strain like an autoimmune condition, the body attacking itself, Semite against Semite. He says he would like to someday travel to the Holy Land, but he can't afford it. And I ask, how much does it cost? And he says he's afraid to fly. And I say, that is a different matter. <laughs> there are pills for that. And he says he doesn't want to take a lot of pills. And I say, you don't have to take a bunch, just one pill going and one pill coming. <laughs> and he pauses his brow, an ancient furrow. And I say, maybe he should do some research about tours and flights and anxiety pills. And maybe just get a passport and don't worry about the rest yet. Don't listen, I say, to the bridge-fearing, xenophobic, claustrophobic, acrophobic, aquaphobic people who love you. <laughs> I le leave them quivering in their big boots while you apply for travel visas. I suggest you save a little money every month. And he considers, as other co-workers pass and enter the roof, room and speak to him about work things, and I wonder if he'll roll forward, and if he imagines that God placed me there, quiet Jew in a dark room who says, go to Jerusalem, go to Jerusalem, <laughs> and I wonder if he's right. Did God place this awkward, non-practicing, detached, apologetic Jew to tell him, fear not the planes, the news, the people, there is a pill for that, my friend. <laughs> Or did God send him to me to reignite my memory and wonder? Oh, I thank you. Um, this is one for Jillian. It's a sestina called, this is called Lemon Sestina. It's 1 a.m. and I'm baking a lemon pound cake, a recipe with too many steps. And the radio plays and suddenly I hear her voice, the tall woman who once cradled a ukulele in her strong hands the year she collapsed at the movies during train wreck. Sometimes a new recipe makes me a wreck. Squeeze, then zest the lemon, cream the butter and sugar, hands holding the bowl steady. Each step calls me closer to a rocking cradle of music, closer to the low, smoky voice. Whip the eggs and wonder if he ever voiced his plan to stalk into the dark auditorium of reckless laughter, scene of summer ease. Did he cradle the gun before he aimed at people holding boxes of lemon drops, junior mints, bags of popcorn, steps away just before the blood on his hands? Who is a heavy-hearted radio host, handsomely broadcasting her wavering voice over the blue city, melancholy tune steeped with sweet tea? Is a studio air damp, records spinning on the summer night, uh, a hot lemon breeze? Does he remember her spirited stride, wooden crates that held her art books? Timer beeps, take out cake, cradle onto wire rack, 20 minutes to cool before you handle, slice it, taste it. She grew victory gardens, hauled lemons and satsumas to neighbors, quick chatter of voices. She played old fashioned songs on the record player across pine floors, waltzed with, with long steps. This cannot last, her muted t-shirt designs, dance steps, baskets of greens and carrots, vintage dresses. The cradle wobbles when a lost, dizzy-headed man with a gun wrecks the summer movie, lets loose on the laughter. Hands drop popcorn, dark bodies go down, chaotic voices cry out, ukulele hands grab hold of forever lemons. The singer two steps away from the pile of wreckage. Montage of last thoughts. Lemongrass, padded seats, milk crates, lost recipes, fallen cakes, flickering light, radio static, dark molasses voices. Okay, one minute.
this is called British Tea. In the British TV programs, right after the frantic cat fight, after confrontation of the dark cloaked stalker, at the scene of the bloody murder, someone chimes, shall I make a nice pot of tea? <laughs> because that makes everything better. Black tea with milk and sugar, scones with Devonshire cream and lemon curd helps everyone just calm down to work out the marital spat, to realize why the priest ran off with someone's daughter, cures a cancer that once seemed terminal, helps Sherlock to figure out the motive for the rampage of murders, soothes the killer into confessing why he did it, hands gloved in black leather, it all works out over a steaming bergamot scented liquid swirled with floral silver spoons and finely painted china cups on a damp, foggy British day. Just a spot of tea tames these drama-infused lives of ours. Thank you. What a weaver of words. Let's give it up for Patrice. She's wonderful and entertaining, too. Who knew that you were Jew? <laughs> I thought you grew up on a Pueblo <laughs> in New Mexico. Our, our next presenter is Kirby Jambon. He has a love of Louisiana French language and culture and it's evident in his work as a teacher, an activist, an actor, a storyteller, and a writer. His passion for poetry is evident, as well as he is an author of three books of Louisiana French poetry, and for one of which he was first, the first Louisianian honored by the award from the Académie Française. He loves children, jokes, music, drama, history, science, science fiction, spirituality, and of course, he adores his wife, their daughter, their dog, his parents, and having a good time. <laughs> a participant of Word Crawl for several years, and this year is his first year reading his English language poetry. Please welcome Kirby. The secret of the creative process in four parts. Part one, a storm within our brain, a cool breeze within our skin, a stifling heat centers our gut, a soul full of freezing rain weathering through metaphors and meteorology and theology and astrology and astrophysics and the physical nature of that which is spiritual. Part two. Graphically organizing all of creation, we are but a Venn diagram of infinite circles meeting at a point tinier than a charmed quark, such as that plane where childhood dreams of being superheroes and heavy metal rock stars and starship captains and the first president to actually end poverty meet up with adolescent relationships and collegiate soul searchers and adult needs to return to younger days or to become wise old sages where we are one with the pantheon of spirits or, and the pansexual soul transgendered and transported and both transcendent and yet at one with the feel of bare feet upon cool spring grass expressed in a poem written in French or another romance language but understood by non-romantic and speakers of every tongue of Babel, even Anglophones. Part Trinity. It's a mystery. Move on to the next part. <laughs> Parto quarto. Art is creation. Creation is adding to the world, adding where there's still room for more. There's room for yours. This poem is about uh, one's pursuit of one's passions, personified by a hopeful man in search of an elusive woman. 
It's called To Each His Own Treasure. He's going to try again. Yes, he knows that he has only the rarest hopes of finding her, but her, his eyes are still burning from the last time he saw her. His tongue remembers her sweetness more than her bitterness. His chest is a battery of drums of love beating for only one. His faith has survived battles and witnessed massacres, and yet it has been searching for her and searches for her still and remains beaten but intact. It is a faith that declares that all chances are created equal even a chance so minuscule that people leave it like pennies on the ground. Yes, without a doubt, of course, absolutely, he's going to try again. She was the only one who understood him and took him seriously. She was the wisest of beauties and the most attractive of intelligences. Oh, he's going to try again. He can see her smile in the eyes of and experiences of the old men who play chess in the park. He can smell her perfume and the sweet sweat of kids running across the playground. In his mind, she never left him. Maybe it was he who left her. It's extremely hard work, but he's going to try again. It's a mission that costs a fortune that he will never earn, but he's going to try again. It's a voyage that can last a lifetime, but he's going to try again. Nothing can stop him. He can't stop himself. If y'all see him, don't be sad if he don't spend a lot of time with you. He's trying again. Look, there he is, bending down to pick a penny off the ground. Congratulations! Who's who among American-y Americans in America has awarded you with your life, planned out according to actuarial tables, with U.S. savings bond accruing interest for AARP awards. You may live here if your level is level one, just above third world level, but your hard work and American dreaming will surely allow you to rise above this level. And if you need help, credit cards can purchase Denial X. Yes, Denial X, the medication you should ask your doctor about. Denial X may cause ulcers, shingles, neurosis, and delusions of grandeur. And you should not take Denial X with other medications for relieving debt or boredom or lack of living life to the fullest. Other medications such as hope or compassion. These may cause sickness to your American Americans dream in America and may result in you forfeiting your award. Who's who among American Americans in America is not responsible for the contents of your life. Um, as a French language poet, I share in this um, a, wonderful, um, a wonderful kind of camaraderie with the other poets. And uh, something that has developed along the years is uh, a common theme. And uh, there's a theme of um, this common image, this motif of the wolf found in um, French Louisiana poets. And um, the, the, the wolf could represent the, you know, a werewolf or the lone wolf or the pack wolf, but regardless, the wolf is there. This one's about a, this is a little short poem about a she-wolf who's, who's an artist and capable of transforming herself into other life forms. Yes, I know, I don't know, I don't get it either, but I'm gonna read it for you anyway. <laughs> the she-wolf paints another masterpiece on the edge of the Golden Arm Lakes, disguised as human and male. Her ferocious tenderness is revealed in the images of her young ones. Her cousins traded in their freedom for furnished meals. But they recognize themselves in her painting. They miss their wayward cousin. They desire to play with her young ones. She, with eyes of a color somewhere between the sky and the clouds, she observes and smells and tastes and hunts that which is real. Her brushes, her senses, and her intuition, her canvas, her reality, her exhibition, nature. The people pull out their hair looking at such damned images. How could a man think to show such things? The reddish paint flows from her teeth. I, I always find my poems always come from a variety of inspirations and you start out with one inspiration and other inspirations come along. This one started out as uh, inspired by a gift from my wife. It was um, a metal box to put my pens in, since I was a writer. And um, it was a big, heavy metal box, and it had a, had a quote on the side by Hermi Ernest Hemingway, who was, uh, one of his nicknames was, uh, his nickname was Papa. And um, I started to you know, begin a poem with that inspiration in mind, and all kind of other inspirations came about. And so this is a poem I call Hemming My Way. 
Papa says the writer must write, not speak what he has to say. But my head crisscrosses the mics and likes and hikes and hype of sports radio and the fantasy images of the gun barrel bra a la Lady Gaga. Uh, how, how do I write all that? Uh, the banality of regional television journalists who know neither the region nor journalism. The anger towards political candidates who brag about the fact that they are not politicians. So why the fuck are you running to be a politician? So how do I say all that? Um, the youth who, who make me laugh, who give me hope. These kids whom I adore. The young who make me frustrated like an old fart. Let it go before you explode, but how? Come on. Come on. So, so you think you can tell heaven from hell. Oh, by the way, which one's pink <laughs> and which one doesn't call me anymore? Goosebumps and marks from her fingernails on my skin during the turbulence of our flight around um, reality. Does the bell toll for me? Uh, at the very least, I must pay a toll. So I spin the blood of my pens and I wear violet to protest violence. I wear purple for those who've committed suicide because of being bullied and oppressed, for being who they are, for loving who they love, for not wanting to have sex with a woman. How do I sing that? Like a fucking seal who's fucked in Alaska? What a damn beautiful shame. Papa, don't preach, but I, I don't remember your stories. Tell them again. Better yet, write them again. But what a damn ugly shame. You put a shotgun in your mouth a year before my birth. You left our world with an anger perhaps similar to mine or to ours. Did you feel our frustration, our confusion, our oppression? How do I write all that? My box of pens is heavy and there's not much ink left. So no matter anyway, these days I write on that damn computer. This one is um, this one is actually um, a little. This one's dedicated actually to my wife, and one of her passions, which is uh, crocheting, and it's called "Honey, Can You Help Me Find My Crochet Hooks?" <laughs> crochet, crocheted hooks, hooked bright and somber, colors hooked together like threads of string theory in the multiple dimensions of our universe or universes, like galaxies that speed away from each other yet sometimes collide, like you and I colliding, you and I theorizing with audacity that our strings are one, like you crocheting me a blue scarf and me pretending that I'm Sherlock Holmes and I wear it and I discover it through attention and observation and sometimes with that magnifying glass you gave me, the crocheted hook together fabric of our lives. And I fight the compelling urge to tear off the frazzled ends, the unwanted parts of our life. For there are those who say, if I do, it may all unravel. So I sing the blues and I wear the blues and the pinks and the greens, the colors we produce together. I wrap them around me, covering me with warmth, yet sometimes making me scratch or choke. But you made this for me, from your fingers with me in mind. And I crocheted these words for you. We are hooked and intertwined. This is no string theory, but a crocheted reality where we love, where we live. Thank you very much. That was great, Kirby. Thank you. Give it up for Kirby again. That's awesome. That's really good. So our eighth Word Smith for this evening at the Omni Center is Jerrica J. Franklin, writing with intentions to be frank at all times. J. Franklin has been creative writing since eight years old. She is the creator of Janguage Arts and has participated at many venues in Alexandria, Baton Rouge, and Lafayette. She has also participated with us before in Word Crawl and Festival of Words. She is currently working to publish a collective book of poetry titled The Birth of a Butterfly and has launched a t-shirt line called Lost Girls, Levitating Over Society's Traditions to Empower All Women Fighting the Odds. Let's give it up for Jay Franklin.
having me wear a crawl. Um, I'm so happy to be here again. Um, so bear with me because um, today is a pretty emotional day for me. So um, yeah, I'm gonna be reading off my phone today if y'all don't mind. So uh, this piece is called Human. It's the silence. It's the voices telling you your voyage is in vain. It's the lack of resources, over your head courses, and emotional pain financial aid can't aid. It's the absence of a family overshadow you and telling you what you can't be and this can't be life, this can't be living. This goes against everything I ever learned in my religion and I am losing it. This isn't home. And I long to go, plant me in the soil. I need somewhere to grow. I need somewhere where the air is clean and my burdens are lighter. I need an angel with wings strong enough to take even me higher. And well, I am afraid of heights, but I am begging to fly, begging for this life to end, but I'm scared to die, laugh because I'm scared to cry, to confess that I'm equal to those who look up to me. I gotta lie down now. Constantly screaming to myself, Jay, you gotta try. No, Jericho, you gotta do. Your biggest opponent is you. And you, my dear, are only human. Thank you. All right, y'all gave me 10 minutes, so um, I'm gonna get comfortable. <laughs> so, um, So this is called Women and Wine. And um, I basically, I wrote this poem about why women drink after breakups. <laughs> Simple. So it says, um, the ending of us was as cold as heavy rain and winds through thunderstorms. It was so dark that I begged God to keep the sun out just a minute longer before the night approached to set off my mental alarm. Still it informed me that the left side of my bed was empty and the match.com ad started to look tempting because <laughs> even after counting sheep, sleep failed to find me until I went to explore aisle four the grocery store, stopped counting my calories or pennies for whatever I got and lo and behold, there were old Pinot Grigio clear as day and it looks like the ache is fading away especially when I see my old friend Zinfandel who would get me drunk enough to expose secrets I swore I wouldn't tell once I got home well it was easy traveling through the tunnel of my throat leaving this bitterness on my tongue the sorrow started to leave me completely appreciating the silence aligning my lips to meet the place where my smile is I feel less lonely the taste of berries meeting burdens, it starts to hold me in captivity, lingering between humor and sensitivity, and I don't know how to feel. And though I don't know how to heal, at least I'm not crying. So I drank, and I laughed a little longer, cried a little less, sent 16 angry voicemails and texts to my ex and doubts I swallowed, traded my teardrops for the last drops of the bottle, and the more I sipped, my mind started to slip into thinking why do women turn to drinking when we're sinking? See, while life is rough, the flow down your throat is smooth. It isn't like people. It isn't like food. It tells you in advance this ugly truth that there are sides and side effects, that too much of this you might regret. Still, we build wine collections for the moments we don't feel the connection. We feel the voids. We feel the voids, so no longer do we hear the noise. And unlike the last touch of an ex-lover, well, this is warm, just like wine bottles. Women model ourselves for the convenience of others, vibrant enough to feel, tasteful enough to feel, <laughs> silent enough to please, and become much more bold throughout the years, all for you. Thank you. <laughs> so I wrote this poem um, I haven't shared with nobody. <laughs> So this is called Mine. I stare at you and wonder of the thoughts that crowd your mind. Look in your eyes in search of the condition of your heart and if I could ever be a part of neither, but neither consist of me. I watch you and wallow in your eyes like bed sheets. I want to know the woman you used to be before you knew me. 
before the woman standing in front of me and what you were like during the time you didn't know yourself. Did you always make men melt? Did you always have the power to make the sun rise and always beautiful enough to make skies cry? My actions would say everything my mouth fails to mention. So I shower you in attention, but often create distance because though I crave you, I never want to crowd you. But your energy does the same thing as loud do you get me high. A piece of my heart departs every time we say goodbye without the embrace of bodies, and you probably never even notice. And though I may be the least of your focus, my hope is I affect you. Hope you recognize that I do not neglect you. My desire is to protect you. My moral is to respect you like I did my own mother or any other woman deserving enough to be called queen. So though I adore you, when I look at you, I ignore the rush and remain amused on how I manifested this eternal crush. <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna have my seat. Oh, bye y'all. Thanks, Jay. Let's give it up for her again. Thanks for sharing your intimate thoughts. Loved it. I said thank you for sharing your intimate thoughts with us. Loved it. Our last speaker tonight is Sydney Prosper Moten. She is a Creole army brat who discovered at an early age that poetry helped make sense of the uncertainty. She just finished writing I Get Wet, How to Jackknife Off of a Pedestal, the story of her college years. And she shared with me earlier tonight that she is working on her certification to become an assistant teacher. So let's, let's welcome Sydney. first poem is as much to take off this hot as shawl as it is for my fellow mothers. Have you ever had so much fun you accidentally made a human? You see, I forgot the rules. You're not allowed to look fuckable if you can prove you've been fucked. <laughs> Sorry, mommy's got a potty mouth, but how you think you got here? And don't give me a biology lesson. I mean, maybe dad's kind of hot. Maybe mom has a spot. Maybe mom was on top. <laughs> the spark of life is not an old white man almost touching a young white man. No homo. The spark of life is walking to a crib after an episiotomy. It's changing diapers, ripping stitches and staples. It's nursing before the epidural wears off. It's Maybe Figs made Eve nauseous. Maybe Cain was kicking her ribs and she just needed to keep something down. The spark of life is badass. It's the adventures of Lois and Clark, led by a pregnant teenager. Sacagawea gave birth in the Rockies, then walked to the Pacific Ocean. The spark of life is not shameful. It looks like stretch marks. It looks like swollen feet. The spark of life is somewhere right now turning heads in a nursing shirt and, a mater and maternity leggings. <laughs> Wine pouring, R&B playing, humming you are my sunshine while rocking upset tummies away. The spark of life is complex and gritty and beautiful. Every time my stomach turns, my heart smiles. Do you know what it takes to love someone? All it takes is a whim, a mere hint that someday soon, they may in fact exist. We should allow teacher-led prayer in public schools. The kids can pray to Krishna in math, Allah in history, 
Learn a Buddhist chant in PE. No? You meant just your God, didn't you? Of course you did. Uh, <laughs> the world over, the faithful sound off and take aim in opposition to one another, but suggest they may all be wrong. Barred from public office in Texas. Prison in Poland. Execution in Nigeria. It's just, what's one more heretic burned at the stake for dragging humanity, kicking and screaming into the future? If there is a God, I would not worship him. I have no need of that hypothesis. I am the doubter. I squint into my microscope. I'm this close to a cure. I beg governments to fund my labs and share my discoveries. They exploit them. Atoms can connect and power the globe or level two world cities. Please heed my warnings. It could be the whole planet next time. It's the whole planet this time. <laughs> you, I explore the cosmos and protect us from it. Yet you question my morality as if astrophysicists are using dissertations as ammo and astrophysicists are passing laws banning petri dishes. Don't put this shit on us. Get out of my classroom. You can't preach abstinence and believe it didn't work once. Um, <laughs> you, <laughs> you thank your imaginary friend for my hard work. Threaten me with your imaginary enemy. On my inventions, I'll shut the whole internet off. If I have questions, I can consult a collection of poorly translated Bronze Age fairy tales or engage with reality. Now, I see you, mad. Fingers pointed firmly at fundamentalists. But if it's always the fundamentalists, the problem's the fundamentals. Prayer can give comfort to some, but someone, somewhere, still has to actually solve the problem. So while the masses squabble over petty nonsense, the doubters will save us all. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. <laughs> An ocean so alive and free, they said you could walk across on the backs of sea turtles. He landed on an island he named San Salvador, the savior. Half the Taino population didn't survive the decade. 23 of me says all my ancestors hail from the water's edge. Maybe that's why the gatekeepers of the land won't touch me. I belong to the sea. These explorers and pirates may brave rumors of tempests and kraken, but they know not to tamper with evidence. My genome is an active crime scene. My curves are not like the fruit of the land. They bend and twist with the current like fingerprints. I have seen schools of sharks abandon 300 million years of instinct to follow the middle passage their blue-gray scales etched onto my eyes. Through the waves, I glimpse, con glimpse conquerors awestruck and an expanse of blue refusing to turn purple. There are no defendants in international waters. Not even sunshine will dive this deep. My skin pales in the darkness. But my hair remembers. It coils into DNA at the slightest touch of the sea. But to be fair, None of that rhymes within 1492. Okay. And my last one is, um, I wrote last summer about my oldest child. The year before pre-K, my little boy corrected his cousin. The rain is not God's tears. It's the evaporation to the clouds. He has to know a lot about the atmosphere if he's going to put robots in space. In pre-K, my smart little boy learns putting robots in space is a real job. And he's never missed a question in math. He refers to all children as my friend. In kindergarten, my smart 
little boy, my smart, kind little boy. This adds DJ YouTuber to his aerospace engineer career goals. He's animated enough for, for it too. He's diagnosed with ADHD and begins medication. His conduct grade goes up. In first grade, my smart, kind, energetic little boy decides he wants to be a cop. That way, at least one will be nice to daddy. He also wants to invent a portal gun so he can visit and study other dimensions and starts reminding me to recycle. In, in second grade, my smart, kind, energetic, socially conscious little boy has an active shooter drill while he has a cold. He wants to bring cough drops to school so the bad man won't hear him. He is still yet to miss a single question in math. No more talk of space, though. As he splashes his little brother and misses his school friends, breaking news in his peripheral, I keep a close watch from a distance. But nature takes its course, always. In August, my little boy starts third grade. Three years younger than Tamir Rice. Two years older than the kids at Sandy Hook. Science and math clutched in little brown hands. Problem or prodigy? I can't hide my little boy from the world. I can't hide the world from my little boy. So how much longer can I keep calling him little? Wasn't she awesome? Thanks, Sidney. And thank you for ending our evening here. It was wonderful. And thank y'all all for attending. And we thank Omni for uh, loaning us the space. And we enjoyed being here. And please join us for the last segment of our events today for Word Crawl 2019. And that'll be at Cite des Arts. Thanks again. Have a good evening.